Joining us now is the great Sarah Fisher of Axios. Sarah, welcome to the show. We really appreciate you joining us. Hey, thanks for having me. Love the show. Thank you very Aww, thank much. Thank you. We the, appreciate your reporting. You are one of the best. Sarah, you were one of the first to really give us some insight into the downfall of CNN+. Plus. Let's go ahead and put this up there on the screen. You first had the instance that they were uh, inside the chaotic collapse there. You first had the reporting that they were suspending marketing operations, and then you were one of the first to the story in terms of talking about the demise. Sarah, I've always respected you as just a great analyst of inside media companies and what's happening here. What exactly happened with the death of this uh, project? Product that they poured $300 million into? Yeah, it's a great question. So about two years ago, CNN executives thought, we really need to get ahead of the linear TV decline. Let's launch a bigger foray into streaming. Now, you have to remember, CNN has experimented with streaming for a really long time. They started CNN Pipeline in the 2000s. They had CNN Go, which is an app that still exists, but it really just allows you to stream the live cable network through authenticating your cable login. They had Great Big Story, which ended up shutting down a few years ago. And so they never really nailed a smart streaming direct-to-consumer app. And so executives said, we're going to do it. In 2021, they start to make a lot of moves towards that. You know, at this point, they hired Alex McCallum, a product whiz from the New York Times, they acquired an app called Canopy, which sort of supported news aggregation apps, and they were ready to build. But the one thing they may not have seen coming was that their parents' parent company, AT&T, was being straddled with so much debt from its media acquisitions that it was looking to spin off Warner Media, which is CNN's parent. And in May, we found out that the decision was made to spin it off and merge it with Discovery, which is run by David Zasloff. The challenge here became Discovery's streaming bet was to build one giant general entertainment app by combining HBO Max and Discovery Plus. But they didn't really have in their long-term vision standalone smaller subscription apps. And that's because they've tried that before. Discovery had launched Golf TV. They had a Food Network app that were all subscriptions, and they were tough to build. And so when it came time for the merger to close, you had a, a bunch of different things that made Discovery very wary about introducing CNN+. Plus. First, in February, CNN's longtime leader, Jeff Zucker, had to resign in a shocking resignation. And that really put Discovery executives on edge. You know, he was the person that would be leading this charge. He's no longer going to be there. And then leading up to the merger, AT&T was very conservative. They didn't want to talk to Discovery because they were afraid of regulatory scrutiny. And so Discovery didn't have great visibility into what was happening at CNN+. And by the time they did in April, when that merger closed, what they saw was CNN had poured hundreds of millions of dollars into an app that they were worried would not become profitable within the four-year timeline that CNN had sketched out. And instead of waiting to make the decision whether or not they were going to support this effort or not, Discovery execs thought that what would be safest would be just to pull the plug early, and that way they could save heartache down the line. And so it's an unfortunate thing. You know, hundreds of jobs are likely going to be lost. A lot of hundreds of millions of dollars were already spent and wasted. But I guess the silver lining here is that Discovery took quick and decisive action as opposed to dragging this thing on a few more months. Yeah, I mean, you sort of have to respect the fact that they, you know, looked at the writing on the wall and the early uh, numbers, which were reported by you and others, which were very poor, you know, fewer than 10,000 people watching in a day, which is, you know, really pathetic, especially when you have that level of spend on marketing. But why did CNN push forward with this and decide to keep the launch date where it was to start with when, you know, it wasn't a secret. We talked about it here. Yeah. I know you reported on it as well that Discovery preferred to go in this direction, that it was likely to, that the CNN Plus um, streaming service would be bundled inside of a larger um, streaming offering. So why did they push forward anyway, knowing that you know this was very much a possibility? Well, I think you have to look at the number. We reported that there were 150,000 people that decided to pay within those two and a half weeks. I don't think CNN executives saw that as a huge failure. I think uh -huh. the challenge is, like any type of subscription streaming, you have to inject a lot of capital up front before you can get the payoff later, and that includes marketing. And so it wasn't necessarily that they thought this thing was going to be so awful, although you're right, some of the daily 
viewership numbers were low. I think it was just that the amount of money they would need to continue to spend to get the numbers to go up would be exorbitant. And that's what Discovery was afraid of. Remember, they're running what is a legacy profitable cable business. It's a different model than something like Netflix or even like an Uber, where you can afford to inject a lot of capital up front for some sort of payoff late. And so I think that's the reason why there is a discrepancy. CNN wanted to move forward. One, I think there was a little bit of, you know, sort of emotional uh, decision making there, right? They wanted to stake a claim in CNN's digital future before the merger. But I also think, too, is that they thought that this was probably successful in a way discovery just did not. Right. I mean, Sarah, what does what the broader cable industry look at this and what's their takeaway? I mean, this is something which is a big problem for them, and I talk about it all the time, which is that their main value add on linear is live TV, which they're not allowed to put on streaming. And a lot of their content on streaming, I mean, I'll say editorially, you don't have to say it, I don't think it's very good. So <laughs> what exactly are they trying to do to plan for their future? Because I'm not a genius. You know, anybody can look at the upcoming negotiation for live TV, streaming, and linear and say they're in a real problem in terms of what their future is going to look like. So everyone's obviously going about streaming as their future, but they're doing different uh, strategies. So one strategy is that direct-to-consumer subscription model. And some cable networks have been absolutely brilliant about spinning that forward, most notably HBO. You know, HBO mm -hmm. was a premium right. cable network that they've been able to spin into a smart direct-to-consumer subscription. The other option is free and ad-supported. And I think it's notable that Netflix said this past earnings that they're going to experiment with an ad-supported tier. And that's just because if you take a look at consumer spend, Consumers have said consistently over the past few years, even throughout the pandemic, they're only willing to spend around $40 a month on subscription streaming services. Other than that, it's going to have to be free ad supported. And so I think what's going to be the future for CNN, Discovery is actually probably going to double down on CNN's free ad supported app. You have to remember, CNN's core digital app is one of the most widely consumed news apps in the world. It's one of the most widely trafficked. So they'd actually be wise to put some video on there, sell some premium video ads against it. I think for other major cable networks, it really depends on sports or not. If you're really invested in live sports, this is a tough one. I think ESPN's done a pretty good job. You put some rights on streaming, some on linear, and you kind of have to do a balancing act. But if you don't have sports at this point, the, pretty much the biggest strategy is get as much of your content as you can on streaming, whether it's through an ad-supported streaming venture, or subscription. And even if it's not the most profitable part of your business night right now, what you will have done is you will have planted the seeds, mm -hmm. have consumer familiarity, have advertiser relationships, so that one day when that cable bundle sort of does collapse, you're at least ready to take on the future. Yeah, I think that's well said. I mean, one of the things that irritated me, I saw some hot takes that were like, oh, you know, subscription-based streaming news just doesn't work. And I think we're uh, here to tell yeah, you that that's not fine. the case. Thank you. Um, yeah. But, you know, it is noteworthy that, look, CNN, Fox, and MSNBC all have their own streaming efforts. CNN Plus was the highest spend and the splashiest rollout, and so it got a lot of attention that the numbers weren't, you know, very impressive. And, of course, it collapsed almost instantly. But the MSNBC streaming service and the Fox News streaming service also don't seem to be exactly doing gangbusters. So what do you think it is about their formulas that just doesn't seem to have much consumer appeal? I don't know the answer to that because I don't know the numbers. Like mm. Fox has never revealed how many people subscribe to Fox Nation. I don't know how many people are viewing MSNBC's Peacock portal. But what I will tell you is you bring up a good point, which is we sort of have this barbell phenomenon. On one end, you have massive scale and really general interest services. And on the other, you have niche. And I would put breaking points in niche. Mm -hmm. Niche is doing excellent right now. If you can cater to a very high, uh, highly engaged audience, they're going to spend a lot of time with you. They're willing to give you a lot of money and they're gonna be very engaged because they like the very specific thing that you're providing for them. The problem is when you try to hit the middle, if you're not super broad and scaled or you're not super niche, you're going to have an issue. Now, mm. when it comes to entertainment or leisure, it's pretty understandable where that barbell lies. There are going to be very, very, very niche entertainment subscription services that do well. My favorite example is Crunchyroll, yep. which is bought by Sony, catered to anime fans. Great example of a niche service that does well. The problem with news 
is niche is really hard to figure out. You either lean into personality programming, which you guys aren't necessarily political personality programming. You don't have necessarily a political take, but you do have very strong personalities. I mean, your brands are ones that I've been following since the Hill and people know you as two distinct people. And so that was why I would put you in niche. In the news sector, if you're not B2B, you know, catering to someone's professional news, if you're Mm -hmm. not sort of personality programming like you guys are, then you have to be massive and broad. And the challenge with CNN is they actually should have and could have been massive and broad. But the way that the subscription streaming service was rolled out, I don't think they had the broadest appeal possible. You could blame that on marketing. You can blame that on competition. I don't know what it was, but it didn't go as broad as it probably would have needed to have gone. I think that's really very interesting analysis. Yep. Sarah, Uh, Sarah, thank you so much. Thank you for the great reporting that we have relied on here on this show many, many times. Appreciate it very much. We rely on you a lot. Everybody go subscribe to Sarah's newsletter. We'll have a link down there in the description. I read it all the time. So thank you very much. We appreciate it. Thank you. I was just going to say, I feel the same way. Like when I have a question about how real people are thinking about things, I call you, Sager. (laughs) And that's like, so I appreciate it. Well, uh, the the appreciation goes both ways. Appreciate it very much. Take care, Sarah. Cable news is ripping us apart, dividing the country, making it impossible to function as a society, and making it impossible to know just what is true and what is false. But the good news is they are failing and they know it. That is why we're building something new, a new mainstream, a healthier one, something more trustworthy, something that we are going to need in one of the most pivotal times in American history. We are building up here for the midterms, for the upcoming presidential election, but we need your help. So if you can help us out by becoming a premium member today at breakingpoints.com, we're trying to change America for the better and the entire world. So what are you waiting for, guys? Go to breakingpoints.com and sign up and help us build a new mainstream.